Jared Goff, Jared Goff, Jared Goff. Welcome to the second round of the playoffs, fellow Lions fans. I'm Dr. Jimmy Liao, University of Michigan Medical School grad, board certified in family medicine, here with your weekly Detroit Lions medical update. Congrats to all the long-suffering Lions fans out there who waited 32 years to see another playoff win. Congrats to all the slightly younger long-suffering Lions fans who just saw their first playoff win. And congrats to all the recent Lions fans who have never suffered at all and think that all we do is win around here. Whoever you are, wherever you are, go ahead and celebrate. Celebrate like all the fans in the stadium who were so loud, so boisterous, and so ecstatic. I heard you, the world heard you, and the Rams definitely heard you. And now we have scientific proof of what happens when you have Honolulu blue balls for 32 years. But this story is not over. So today, Wednesday evening, I'll be reviewing all our Lions who are dealing with injuries, including Sam Laporta, Jameson Williams, Alex Anzalone, Aiden Hutchinson, Kali Freeman, James Houston, and more. And I'll review the Wednesday official injury report for both the Lions and Bucks as we look forward to our next playoff game. I'll do all that next. First win in the playoffs since the year of 1992 when I was still in high school. We dominated the Cowboys that game. And I remember after the game, there was all this talk about how the Cowboys needed to do all these things in the offseason to catch up to the Lions, like get more cornerbacks, get better defense. There was a lot of hope for the future back then. I remember in the offseason that year, I'd go to the magazine stand. Yeah, a lot of you guys remember what that is. And I would read all those NFL preview magazines like Athlons, Sporting News, Lindy's, and a couple more I don't remember the names of. The thought was that the Lions and Cowboys would be competing for years in the NFC. Sadly, we knew how that turned out with the Cowboys winning three more Super Bowls and the Lions never winning another playoff game until just a few days ago. You never know what the future is going to bring, so hopefully the Lions take advantage of the opportunity this year. We're a very healthy team right now, and maybe that'll give us the edge as we continue along in these playoffs. So let's get to the Rams postgame report. Pretty clean game overall. No major injuries. We did see Alex Anzalone go down briefly in the first quarter at the 8-minute mark, then again for a longer period in the fourth quarter about the 8-minute mark. Trainers had to come out to him in the fourth quarter, and he left the game briefly, but then he returned and finished the game. He played all game with this right shoulder brace, which is the suspicion for this injury. Now look back at the rest of this year. He's had this same brace all year long, including game one versus the Chiefs. So then I look back at 2022, and he was wearing that right shoulder brace all 2022 as well, including in game one versus the Eagles. So this appears to be a chronic shoulder injury for him, but it looks like he should be fine with no issues for the next game. Aiden Hutchinson had a respiratory infection during the game. You could hear that during his post-game press conference. He played 76% of snaps, which is a little bit lower than his typical 90 plus percent. There are high levels of influenza across the country right now, including in Michigan. There are various other viruses and bacteria that can cause respiratory infections though, so it could be any number of things. Hopefully he recovers quickly from that. He's a young, healthy guy, so I have no major concerns there. Now I want to talk briefly about Stafford's possible concussion. We all saw that. His eyes rolled in the back of his head, and he was limp for a couple seconds there. A key thing to note is our knowledge of concussions right now is still very low compared to pretty much every other body system. We don't know why animals have to sleep. We don't know why it takes six weeks for a psych med like Prozac to start working. So our knowledge of the brain in general is just low. Just 20 years ago, the protocol for concussions was if you were asymptomatic for 15 minutes, you were okay to keep playing, even if you got knocked cold. Things have rapidly changed recently over the past couple decades, but there's still a lot of guesswork and a lot of flux going on with concussion management. So did Stafford have a concussion? I'd say pretty good chance that he did, but you can't say that for sure. 
the neurologist might have a 95% confidence of saying he had a concussion. Another neurologist might only say 80%. So it's sort of a gray area there, and there's no lab or imaging test that you can do on the sideline or in the locker room or even afterwards that can tell us if Stafford had a concussion for those few seconds. Now, how can we explain those eyes rolling back in the head? Well, one possibility is that he could be faking things or embellishing things to try to draw a flag. If you ask Stafford to explain what happened, that's probably the explanation he would try to give because he does not want a concussion diagnosis. We see quarterbacks and wide receivers do this all the time when they get hit to draw a flag. They stay on the ground for longer than normal, hold their head, lie down, writhe around maybe a little bit. There's no question that the ref is more likely to throw a flag if you look like you just got a head injury. And those 15 yards are critical for a game. Maybe another possibility is he forgot he was in a dome and was looking up at the sky for the waxing crescent moon, what apparently was also present 32 years ago for the last Lions playoff victory. So who knows for sure what's going on with concussions, a doctor can't make an official diagnosis based on a guess. And the neurologist on site, he can't be changing outcomes of games if there's really any doubt. It's just not an appropriate thing to do, especially with the enormous stakes of a playoff game, as well as the stakes of a future contract. Any kind of concussion diagnosis can absolutely affect contract status future contracts, and if you get fired or not from the NFL. Imagine if this had happened to Goff and he was down for a second or two and the neurologist pulled him out for the rest of the game and we went on to lose the playoff game. It would have been a disaster, so a neurologist cannot do this unless there is very good certainty that somebody had a concussion. So I don't think what happened with Stafford was as clear-cut as, say, the famous Tua Tangavaloa issue in 2022, where he was getting up wobbly, had difficulty standing or difficulty even walking, lasting 10 to 20 seconds. They did not diagnose with him with a concussion at that time. Four days later, he plays again, gets a second concussion, then he's out for multiple weeks. We saw this to a slightly lesser extent this year with C.J. Stroud. In the Broncos game, he got hit hard, got up with wobbly legs like you see in a boxer, was not diagnosed with a concussion, played a week later, got another concussion versus the Jets, and then ended up missing two weeks. So back to Stafford, this is not the first time it looked like he had a concussion on the playing field but was not diagnosed with one. In 2020, three years ago, when he was still playing with us, he had one of these episodes in Game 8 versus the Vikings. He got up clearly dazed, Multiple teammates had to come over to check on him, including Danny Amendola, Ode Abushi. The ref, Cleet Blakeman, sent him immediately off. Give credit to him for recognizing it. He was evaluated on the sideline and then sent to the locker room for further analysis. Did not return to the game, which typically signifies a concussion diagnosis, but then the next day comes along and no diagnosis of a concussion, even though he clearly had significant concussion signs on video. So not the first time that Stafford has had a likely concussion on video, but never officially diagnosed with one. He's able to pass that sideline screening test. He might be the kind of guy who's able to clear his head quickly enough to pass the protocol, pass the exam. And he's also not the kind of guy who's going to self-report symptoms. We know what Stafford is. He's a tough guy. He's going to play through everything. He's not going to report a concussion symptom that's going to sideline him that game or for future games. Now, many, if not most, concussion symptoms cannot be seen by the doctor. They must be self-reported by the patient, like nausea, fogginess, trouble thinking clearly. A doctor can't see that. A doctor can only see obvious concussion signs like not being able to walk straight or obvious short-term memory loss or inability to say remember the year or remember who the president is those kind of things so this is a gray area with what happened to Stafford and we saw a similar situation with a couple of our Lions players this year with David Montgomery in the first Vikings game 
got hit hard, was down on the ground for a split second longer than normal, and then had blinking eyes on the sideline. We saw this with Aleem McNeil in Thanksgiving, got hit hard on the side of the head, was down for quite a bit with his head on the ground. Those possibly could have been concussion symptoms, but a neurologist cannot diagnose it based on just those videos. So enough about concussions. Let's get to some positive news. Sam Laporta, our beautiful bouncing baby boy of a tight end, he played in a real actual NFL game just seven days after I saw his career flash before my eyes. Finished with three receptions, 14 yards, and one touchdown. Here's the summary of his injury. Hyper extended his left knee on video. MRI public report just mentioned a hyperextension and bone bruise. There was likely possible sprains to multiple knee ligaments, though, including the PLC, which is the posterior lateral corner, the MCL, which is the medial collateral ligament, and the PCL, which is the posterior cruciate ligament. If there was a sprain to any of these, it was very mild, though. He was able to play through it. Now, the bone bruise also likely means some trauma to the articular cartilage, which is the cartilage covering the surface of the bone. This kind of injury can impact burst and jumping ability. Travis Kelsey had a bone bruise two days before the season started, ended up looking significantly less athletic this year than in previous years. His stats were still great, but he didn't have that quickness and elusiveness, which was his hallmark throughout his career. No way to say for sure if it's related to that injury or if it was something else, but certainly it's possible that that bone bruise and possible articular cartilage damage had an impact on Kelsey, and we may see similar issues with Laporta as we go along in these playoffs. So how long does a bone bruise take to heal? Well, I dug into some research on that, and it certainly depends on the severity of the bone bruise. The only study I found was in the American Journal of Rentgenology, which is another word for radiology, apparently. Well, they tracked healing on MRI, which showed that the median time for it to be healed on MRI was 42 weeks. That's almost a year. So there's certainly a lot of variability, of course, and a young NFL player with a healthy knee likely is going to be healed much more quickly, but it could easily still take a couple months for that bone bruise to completely heal. And that study is only measuring the healing of the bone bruise, and not the healing of any possible articular cartilage damage which is a much more difficult thing to study and a much more of an unknown issue. So bottom line is Sam Laporta likely won't be back to full strength this season. He'll play through it though. He'll do his healing when the season is over, but he should be back to his normal self by the start of 2024. Another guy who returned from injury is Jameson Williams. He missed one game with what looked like a right low ankle sprain on the video. Probably could have played last week on it, but giving him a rest was a good idea. Did not appear to aggravate it during this game against the Rams, so that's good news. He played 70% of snaps, had two receptions for 19 yards. He should be stronger next game, so look for him to get more targets, especially with Khalif still likely out. Speaking of Khalif, injured last game of the season, January the 7th against the Vikings, landed hard on his knee, possible PCL sprain, which can be a multi-week injury depending on severity. For example, Lamar Jackson in 2022 missed the last five games of the year with his PCL. It won't affect the 2024 season, but there's a decent chance he could miss the rest of this season. But if we make it to the Super Bowl, which is February the 11th, that'll be over a month since this injury, so there's a chance he could be back for that. He signed a two-year, $10.5 million contract in the offseason, so he's under contract still through the 2024 season, for which he should be fully healthy. James Houston, we saw him get three FPs, full practices, last week, which was a great sign, but he was still out for this game. To recap what's going on with him, week two, severe right high ankle sprain with associated fibula fracture. It was always a four to six month estimate, and we are at the four month mark now, so still slightly in the early part of that window. His 21 day practice window ends this Thursday. Now, just because his practice window is ending doesn't mean he's going to be ready. 
they had to open this window when they did because it was a now or never timeline issue. Now, if he's not ready, I think they likely still find a spot on the active roster for him. He'll just be one of the seven inactives on game day. Hopefully, if we can go farther in the playoffs, at some point he will be fully ready to play, maybe even possibly this week against the Bucs. Now, why might he still not be ready after four-plus months? Well, it was a severe injury, first of all. Second of all, his game is totally dependent on his ankles being strong. His ability to bend the corner requires his ankles to have good flexion, good strength, good torsion. So he may not even be worth playing until he's close to 100%. So just because he had full practices doesn't mean he's close to that 100%. Guys who will not be returning this year are Jerry Jacobs, who was put on IR for unspecified reasons, but he was listed with a thigh and knee on the practice report. Never saw any injury with him on video, but he was mostly exclusively playing on special teams lately the past few games of the season. We usually don't get good video of special teams play on the TV broadcast. Putting on IR does free him up on a roster spot for the Lions and does keep him on the team for the rest of this year. He is a RFA this offseason, a restricted free agent, so we'll see what happens if we bring him back next year. Sort of a disappointing season for him. Now remember, he tore his ACL in 2021. He returned midway through 2022. Probably fully recovered from that ACL, but it's always possible there are residual effects from an injury like that, especially if there's any cartilage damage. The ACL heals great. You're just connecting point A to point B. Cartilage damage does not heal great, if at all. So that's something that can cause residual effects. His season arc reminds me a lot of Jeff Akuda, who had an Achilles tear in 2021, but was able to return for the start of 2022. Jeff Akuda started the season very strong, was a solid starter, was playing great. We thought he might live up to his third overall draft pick, but then he started getting benched later in the year, possibly due to injuries, possibly due to coach's decision, hard to say. Never really saw any significant injury on the field, though, but it's possible that Achilles' tear did cause issues as the season wore on. Maybe that's what happened to Jerry Jacobs. Now, another guy who got placed on IR was James Mitchell. There was a pic online of him last week showing a left hand wrap post-surgery. Placed on IR, so presumably out for the year. Unfortunate because he was looking pretty good out there with Brock Wright being out the past three weeks, the last three weeks of the season. Somehow, James Mitchell heard it during the week. Maybe he heard it during practice. Maybe he heard his hand after practice punching a Stafford voodoo doll. Maybe he heard his hand pushing that enormous wheelbarrow around that carries Dan Campbell's testicles. Who knows? Regardless, a hand injury is tough to play through at the tight end position, which requires him to occasionally be able to catch a ball. Unlike, say, Alex Anzalone, who only missed one game with his thumb surgery. James Mitchell is in the third year of his four-year rookie contract, so he is signed through the 2024 season. Now, let's go over the Wednesday injury report. In general, both the Lions and the Bucks are pretty healthy right now. That might be a big reason why both teams are still alive in the playoffs at this point. As usual, the abbreviations I'm going to use are FP, full practice, LP, limited practice, and NP, no practice. Start with the Lions. Frank Ragnow, typical rest day, NP, no concerns there. Khalif Raymond, unfortunately an NP with his knee. Dan Campbell said today in his presser he was getting better and that there was a chance this week. However, he's only 10 days out from his injury. If this is a PCL spring, then that's pretty unlikely he'll be back this weekend, especially with the NP. If it's not a PCL and it's just a contusion, then it's much more likely he will be able to play. But we'll need to see LP or FP later this week for that to happen. Alex Anzalone with his shoulder. He's had the shoulder issue for a long time now. He's been wearing that brace for at least a couple years. He had a shoulder injury since his days at University of Florida in college. He missed 12 games with his shoulder in his rookie year, 2017. Missed 14 games in 2019 with his shoulder and ended up having surgery for it at that time. 
In 2021, with us, he missed the last three games with that shoulder. So this is clearly a chronic issue for him. He's been playing through it for years. So hopefully it's not too flared up. With the LP, as well as him finishing the game, last game against the Rams, he should be fine to play this weekend. Brian Branch was on there with a knee. Did not see any injury on the video. He played 98% of snaps in the Rams game, including the final snap. And with an FP, he should be fine for this weekend. James Houston had a FP, which was expected since he had three FPs last week as well. Just because he has an FP doesn't mean he's going to be ready to play this weekend. We'll just have to see how it goes. If he's inactive, he's just going to be on one of the seven inactives. I expect him, even if he doesn't play, to be put on the roster, though. So they might have to make a move on Thursday to cut somebody else to make room for James Houston. If he is active this weekend, I'm still not expecting a whole lot from him. That ankle is a major factor in his effectiveness. So don't expect too much from him, especially his first game back. Kirby Joseph had a knee injury. He's got an FP, though. He played 64% of snaps in the game, including the final snap. So I'm not overly concerned here. He should be fine. Sam Laporta, as expected, had an FP. He will play without an issue. He might be slightly hampered, though, with that bone bruise. Brock Wright has an FP with his hip, so he's fine. He returned to play against the Rams after missing three games. He played 23 snaps, which was 41% of the offensive snaps in that game. Of good news, the O-line is intact and healthy, which is multiple weeks in a row now. Let's go on to the Bucks. They only had a walkthrough today, so it's hard to read too much into their report. Shaquille Barrett, linebacker, he played the game against Philadelphia, plays around 70% of snaps usually. He had an NP with an ankle. Yaya Diaby had an NP with a shoulder. He did hurt his right shoulder during the Philadelphia game last week, but he returned to the game. He typically plays around 60% of snaps, so he's a pretty important player for them. He's a third-round rookie. He'll be one to monitor going forward, but since he returned to the last game, I expect him to be available. Chris Godwin did not see him go down during the Philly game. He has an NP with a knee. I'm expecting him to be available. Chase Edmonds also did not see him go down during the game. He was listed with a toe and an NP. He's a running back who's got 49 carries for 176 yards for the year, so not a major factor for them, but I expect him to be available. Baker Mayfield is on the report with ankle ribs and an FP. No issues with him. He'll play. Now, it's interesting to compare this report with our week six report against them. There are a bunch of guys we have playing this weekend that are not that were not available in week six. Brian Branch had a right high ankle, missed that game. Jameer Gibbs had a hamstring and missed the game. Jonah Jackson had a left high ankle and missed the game. And Josh Pascal had a knee injury during practice and was out. So those four guys are going to be back for us this game. Also, CJ GJ was out with his pec still in that week six game. He's back playing for us. David Montgomery hurt his ribs during that first Tampa Bay game, missed about half the game. So we were missing both our running backs for a large portion of that game, and both of them are going to be available this weekend. Also, Jameson Williams, that was only his second game back, so he was just getting back into the swing of things. So he's at full strength now and fully integrated into our offense for this game. So big difference comparing that Week 6 report to this weekend's report. On the Bucks side in that Week 6 game, the only guy that was out was Anthony Nelson, defensive lineman. Otherwise, they were fully healthy. So that's it for this week. Enjoy the Bucks game Sunday afternoon. Celebrate it. Savor it because you never know if that next playoff victory is going to be in seven days or 32 years. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching.